Ezekiel chapter 14. <coughs> that is our text this evening. Ezekiel 14. Merry Christmas. <coughs> Everybody. I appreciate whoever turned down the air conditioner after the service today. It was pretty hot in here during the service, but now it feels like Christmas. Uh, with that, uh, it came upon the midnight clear and then, and then silent night, though I felt as though somebody needed to dim the lights. This is the wrong setting for, you know, these, you know, this soft mood, Christmas setting, carol song kind of thing. But I noticed you guys kind of speed up the tempo as well to keep up with the lights in here and so forth. But, uh, you know, I, I really do appreciate having good lighting in, a, in an auditorium because that way you can read your Bibles. And it, it just seems that, that the whole, I don't know, a lot of churches just don't have good lighting for reading the Scripture. And you go in, you can't, you know, well, I don't have any trouble with it, but I'm told by people uh, that have trouble with bad lighting when they read that it's difficult. So it's a help here, but every now and again you think, man, it's bright for a midnight clear. It's a very bright midnight clear. So, it's, it's bright and clear, I guess. All right, it has nothing to do with anything. Would anyone like to share this evening a Christmas testimony? And by that, I do not mean share what Christmas means to you, your interpretation, but Christmas for what it is. Uh, anyone have just a Christmas testimony that you'd like to share? Now I confused you, right? You're like, oh no, nothing's going to pass here. What I mean is don't share a Hallmark movie. <laughs> uh, don't, don't give me a Hallmark movie of your life where uh, the single girl is going to be engaged to a, a main single guy and they're separated over Christmas and so they both find themselves unable to get to their wedding and the girl meets a better guy and doesn't like him at first and then after a little while she finds out he's a lot better than her other guy and now she's in the awkward situation where She's supposed to marry this guy, but this guy's better. I'm telling you how Hallmark works. And then after that, what happens is there's a misunderstanding about the guy. The guy never has the misunderstanding about the girl. The girl always has the misunderstanding about the guy. And she thinks that he's really in love with someone else. And so she puts him off. He comes to pick her up for the date. And they're just about to get serious. They've kind of committed themselves to kicking out the other guy or kicking him off to the curb and marrying each other instead, and then she thinks, oh no, he's in love with someone else, and so she goes cold. She won't talk to him. She comes and picks up, never mind, I'm going home. And then after that, her family comes and says, why don't you love this great guy? Go to him. And so she calls up, and oh, I'm sorry I misunderstood, and then they get married and live happily ever after. And it, there are thousands of those movies <laughs> that are all exactly the same. And they're all about Hallmark. And so that is not what Christmas is about. But those are Hallmark Christmas movies. And someone needs to write Hallmark and tell them that Jesus was born. And that's what Christmas is about. So anyone have any of those because Jesus Christ was born? Uh, this is what Christmas is to me this year. Or this is what Christmas, what this is what uh, Christmas has become, or something like that. Sorry, I had to give the hallmark explanation. Yeah, Patty, go ahead. I'm just grateful that Jesus came into the world to save sinners like me. Yeah, yeah. Man, I'm reminded of uh, at Christmas time. I'm just reminded of how much God loves unworthy sinners. Mm -hmm. It just blows me away. How much God loves people that shouldn't be loved. I, uh, I have maybe a little, something a little lengthy, but uh, <clears throat> this Christ, this Christmas in particular, just because there's been a lot of tra transition in my life this year with me and my children, it feels pretty special. Not that they all haven't been, but this one just feels a little bit more special. Um, that, uh, you know, I feel victory through Jesus in my life uh, with my children. And, uh, you know, I've, I've also struggled with other carnal things of the world, you know, during this transition in my life. And I think, and, uh, you know, 
yesterday I found out my father had a stroke. And, you know, as hard as that is, and it is, um, I just feel that I have so much grace and victory through Christ, and it really... So much of it. It it really excites me, and, uh, and it just makes me so happy that, like, you know, Christ is in my life, and in my children's life, and I'm in this church's life, like, we're all part of it, and it gives me a lot of strength to move forward, and it also convicted me as well, just knowing that all of these years I've been blessed, and I've been given everything I've ever needed, and I've wasted all of that time without, uh, you know, I've wasted all of those blessings and, and all of that time not giving as much as I can to live and walk for Christ and in a church. And so that being said, that present, you know, from God, from Christ right now is like very, very special because I just feel no need to be in carnal sin. I just feel so grateful and excited to move at zero to hundred God speed, you know. So that's that's my testimony. Amen. Amen. Yeah. John? I get so tired of, of all of the Christmas music. If I hear that little drummer boy again. Is that the one? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Anyway, I heard that years. No, but but really, uh, it's all this worldly music and all of the things, you, the decorations you see around the stores, and I'm not even calling it Christmas anymore, and you say right. happy holidays or something yeah. like that. Uh, it just makes me ever, all, ever more just want to, to bring Christ back into Christmas in my own yeah. life and Amen. family. Mm-hmm. That's the benefit, isn't it? When the world tries to stomp Jesus out of you, at least you realize what's <clears throat> going on, yeah. and you realize the value of what you have. Amen. Thank you. Mrs. Price? I love Christmas. And I, I, I guess even though I was born after the cross and Jesus was born, all of that, I still, in my heart, feel just that constant longing that they had for him to come and for that promise to be fulfilled. I, it just impressed me so much how long of a wait it must have seemed for mankind from the time of Adam and his sin for Christ to come, and yet still believing in, in the fact that God would put himself in a human body just because it had to be done if I was going to be rescued. And that, that my sin, the wall of partitions, is broken down and I can be close to God. And I don't have to wait thousands of years to be close to God. And it happened because Christ died for me in my place and I'm close to Him. At, you know, every moment I can be close to Him. If my heart would be cleansed every moment. Mm-hmm. I'm so grateful, so grateful that God would do that for me. Mm-hmm. Lee? We were driving around last night with the teens for the scavenger activity, and <coughs> several of the things that you were looking for were things that could be found in a manger scene, and it was surprising to me how ma- how few manger scenes we could find at all. Uh, I think we found three, maybe four, in the entire time we were out. You know, you see lots of lights, you see lots of wreaths, and the other things that people call Christmas, but you don't see that and it just impressed upon me again the need for this area to know about the gospel yeah amen yeah yeah no you already had time can i have a short little phrase yeah <laughs> um the children in our sunday school class they didn't know what christmas is they just don't and this year it seems like they really well, they did. They paid attention, and they're all able to answer the questions and everything. And it's you know, just sitting there, but really, so it's great this year. They really, really know they got it. How many kids were in Sunday school this morning? Oh, uh, seventeen. Yeah. I just love that, you know, because that's you know I, I say all the time our kids, our children are are now. They are the now generation, and even exceedingly so the teenagers. But uh, they are, that's where it's at. And when you see a good group of young people, we our strongest groups in our church are our young groups. And I just think about that. I just think, man, we've got a bright future. And, you know, God's going to work. God's going to do some mighty things. And man, if he gets in some of these kids' lives and they get empowered by the Spirit of God, mm-hmm. there are things that we're going to be like, wow, you know, look what God's done. 
And we have, we serve a great God and the power of the gospel. And I just love it that that our this generation of young people are so reachable. Our teenagers are just wonderful. Our kids, our, our, all the groups in our in our church are. And I just just we just have such a valuable present right now, and just love that. It's encouraging me. <clears throat> all right. Are you in Ezekiel chapter 14? Well, I meant Ezekiel 12. No, I did. No, I did. I just, I just thought that this evening, since I was accurate for once about where to go, that usually I tell you the text and I tell you look back a few verses to the chapter before for our context. I'm not going to do that this evening. We're going to start in Ezekiel chapter 14 uh, and let's begin reading. Uh, and I, I just want to read down to verse 5. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts, in their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I then be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, Notice the phrase, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Father, please help us with our understanding. Help us with application. Help us to look first at our hearts and allow your spirit to judge us. And then, Father, help us to look Help us to look at uh, believers, or pseudo-believers, and just help us to see things through your eyes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This has always made an impression on me, and it is because of the audacity and the hypocrisy uh, that I'm impressed here. i impressed, I don't mean like, wow, that's great. I'm just uh, surprised and amazed <clears throat> at the lack of guilt, the lack of shame that the elders of Israel have when they come before a true prophet of God. The audacity that they have. The lack of fear of the holiness of God. The lack of concern for sin and for truth that these individuals have. It just surprises me and amazes me and I'm, I'm just... It's just incredible to me. The Bible says that Ezekiel is writing, he's just giving an encounter, he's saying what happened and what God told him. And he said, of course, if we give our setting here, you'd know that the nation of Israel are in captivity. And in captivity, they've come before Ezekiel, they've come to sit before him. And the assume, the assumption is that the message they're looking for is deliverance. That's what they're looking for, isn't it? I mean, here they are, the official elders of Israel. They're the representatives for the tribes of particularly Judah. And they come up before Ezekiel, the true prophet of God, and they're looking for deliverance. That's what they're coming for, Ezekiel. We're going to inquire of God. Ask God if we can be delivered from captivity. The irony of it is that their captivity, of which they're concerned about, is their captivity with another nation. But the captivity for which they are unconcerned is the fact that they're captive to idols, false idols. <clears throat> and iniquity, that is just wickedness, sins in their hearts. And that's their true captivity. There's one type of captivity is external, but we know that an individual can be in physical captivity and yet be free. I love the clear teaching in the New Testament to servants and masters. Because the New Testament of the Scripture is not endorsing or condoning slavery. But what it is explaining to slaves is that you're not a slave if you're free. Let as many uh, servants as are under the yoke. What does the scripture say? 
What? Man. I don't have to quote it. I don't know what it says. I was hoping you did. <laughs> uh, yeah, it talks about just give their master all honor. Give them due honor. In other words, and the reason is that you're going to receive your reward from the Lord, not from a person. So what you do as unto the Lord, you can do to an unjust ruler or whatever, but you do it for the Lord, and you're free. You know, there's the opposite. There's the rebel, isn't there, who, though he may be in, conf in, he may be in conformity, yet inside he's unconformed. He's unbending. I'm doing this because the consequences are greater than I'm willing to accept, but I'm not doing it willingly. I'm doing it because I have to. And that's the same as not doing it at all as far as the Lord is concerned. And so, here we find national Israel. They're very, very concerned about their captivity and they're wanting to know from a true prophet of God who can tell them what God's opinion is. They're wanting to know, hey, what's the word about our captivity? And God's not concerned about that captivity. They could have, they could have read what God told Jeremiah and they'd have known all about that. What is their concern then? Well, their concern is not about their sin. Now let's look at this. Let's analyze it just briefly. And in verse 3, this is what God said to him. I think of it through Ezekiel's eyes. This is the scene he sees. He sees these men, leaders, representatives of Israel, the theocracy, the nation under God. Son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? That's not just a rhetorical question. It's a question that has an obvious answer to it. These men, Ezekiel, these men are worshiping idols and they've got sin in their hearts. Should they ask me anything? Should they be talking to me at all? No. No. <clears throat> I'm convinced that they're asking God and hoping for no answer. I'm convinced that's what they want. In other words... They didn't have to go into captivity, did they? Why did they go to captivity? Because what God told them was unacceptable and they had rather go to captivity than conform to God's way of living. So I'm convinced that what they're hoping is God knows their hearts. Who cares you know, about God as long as Ezekiel thinks we're legitimate? Let's just show up, let's look good, and let's ask him, hey, what's God say? And obviously, God's not going to speak to us because we're not right, but hey, I won't tell if you don't tell. And you have this camaraderie of idolatry. If you think for an instance that every single one of the elders thought that the other ones were sincere and pure, no, 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 they were complicit. They were all in on it. It was a big game to them. Let's go inquire the true prophet of God, expecting no answer. And God said, should I, should I be inquired of? Is it right for idolaters to inquire of the true living God? Should God speak to people that worship false gods? No. No, He should not have been inquired of, of them. And so God here is bringing out the audacity of their inquiry. He's saying, you have no right talking to me. You have no right speaking to me. And the notion that I would answer you, well, let's see about that. And so God told Ezekiel, He said, here's what I see. In verse 5, verse 3, He said, therefore speak unto them, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. <laughs> okay, now you'd think God would say, I'll be just as silent 
according to the multitude of his idols. In other words, you know, the more idols he has, the less I'll speak. But God said the opposite. He said the more idols he has, the more I'll speak to him. You think, well, what's God going to say? They're hoping for deliverance. So what they're looking for is a message of deliverance. And God said, I'll, I'll tell them a lot. The more idols they have, the more I'll tell them. And furthermore, look down at this. Verse 6. Therefore say, the, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from your abomination. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separated himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, Notice, idolatry separates us from God. And putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. <laughs> you know, this idol, this idol, this idol, this idol, this stumbling block, this sin, this wickedness. Let's find out what God says. Let's throw God in the lump. Just add Him to it all. And so they do all this, and then they inquire of God. Then the message, he said, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. He said, Ezekiel, you don't need to give an answer for me. I'll talk to him. Notice this. I love this. Um, and I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. How many of you, when your children had this happen to you? How many of you, I should qualify you, when you were children and you had siblings? And you ever had mom or dad send a sibling with a mom says or dad says message? I'm talking about, mom says you have to come in and say, right? now, you know, siblings never say it like mom and dad do. Uh -huh. They're sassy when they say it, right? Because uh -huh. they've got authority that isn't their own and they're, you know, just, it's just oozing out of them. So... Mom says, you have to come in and say, right now, you know, a sibling comes. And so you say to sibling, you know, all right, I'll be in a little bit. You know, and then smack him around a little bit. So, you know, eh, you don't talk to me like that, little sibling. You're not mom, you're not dad. And then, you're right in the middle of telling them something or saying something to them, or I'll come in when I'm good and ready. You know, come in when I feel like coming in. And you said that. And then, why did mom send them when she's standing right around the corner? Like, why, 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 why did dad send them when he was right there? I could have told him, and there's dad. See, the children of Israel are fine having Ezekiel tell them whatever from God. Because they're not concerned about Ezekiel. He's just a man. He's just a prophet, albeit he's a true prophet of God, but he's only Ezekiel. It's what he represents that makes him have authority. And God said, Ezekiel, excuse me, I'll speak to them myself. Huh. I don't want to go too far here because I think sometimes we can exalt the quote, man of God or servant of God too much. You know, believers oftentimes will go to lunch after church. Well, I don't really agree with what pastor said about... You know what I'm talking about? Well, you know, I, I know pastor believes that. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm talking about? Nobody ever does that in our church, but I've been to churches where people did that. I don't know they don't do it here. No, nobody does. But, well, you know, I, you know, pastor's not quite... You know, he doesn't really understand. And they start with that. Well, then just kick him out of your life and let God talk to you directly. Look out. Yeah, look out. Look out. If you won't let God's authority minister to you, God says, okay, authority, you step aside. I'll handle this one. <laughs> if I can't send the little guy, I'll go myself. Have you ever sent someone to do something for you and they were not received appropriately and so you had to go yourself? It's a lot worse, isn't it? You ever not receive somebody and someone had to come to you and say, listen, that came from me. 
You're not obeying them. You're not disobeying them. You're disobeying me. And God said to Ezekiel, He said, stand aside, stand away, stand back for a minute. I'll talk to them. <laughs> they think, let's go ask Ezekiel what God says. See what he says. Let's go talk to Ezekiel. And God said, Ezekiel, they've got idols in their hearts. Tell them, if you want to come inquire of me, then I'll answer you. I'll talk to you. I'm reminded that God has never been distant. God's never been distant from anybody. And even when the children of Israel desired of Moses, Moses, we want you to be the go-between between us and God. We're too, God's too dreadful for us. God's, the fear of God is too much for us. We're afraid of His presence. And so you, you speak to God and you tell us what God says. It was a little bit of the same game, wasn't it? The children of Israel who wanted to all walked with God and God spoke to them. How do you think David became the prophet David? Was he a priest? Was he the tribe of Levi? No, he had a relationship with God. How do you think Solomon had the wisdom to know how to build the Lord's house? And we could go on and on and on. My friend, the relationship with God, God has never been distant from anyone. God has never removed His presence from anyone. Furthermore, oftentimes when individuals play at wanting God's presence, God says, here I am! And I'm about to tell you something. And that's precisely what Ezekiel is being told here. So here's the message. Of course, there's the message of hope. Verse 6, Therefore say unto the house of God of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourself from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Ezekiel, what's God say about deliverance? Well, here's what God says about deliverance. Nothing. But God did say, repent and turn yourself from idols. God said, let's deal with the real issue here. Let's deal with the real matter of the heart here. Repent, turn yourself away from idols. But verse 8, if you won't, I will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb and I will cut him off from the midst of the people and ye shall know that I am the Lord. I don't, won't need Ezekiel to tell you that I'm real. You'll know it for yourself and I'll cut you off. Judgment. And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I the Lord have deceived that prophet. God said, furthermore, one more thing. If you don't wish to go to Ezekiel to hear, but you had rather go to a false prophet, a lying prophet, a pretend prophet, who has the message you want, God said, I'll give him the lie. <laughs> I'll help him deceive you. You want to be deceived? I'll give him the lie for you. I'll speak to the false prophet. The false prophet will be, wow, God's really talking to me. It'll be lies. Does it make God a liar? No, God's not a liar. He's, he is using a lying prophet for a person who has a lying heart. He's letting them be deceived by their own lie. And he said, I'll stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. He said, I'll destroy the prophet. He'll go off and be doing his living out his lie, and I'll destroy him for it. In verse 10, They shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. And here's the purpose, that the house of Israel may no, go no more astray from me, neither be it polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. Now I have to say this evening, the message is blunt, Harsh, direct, and there is no punch pulled. But the conclusion is God wants to be your people. He wants to be your God. And He wants you to be His people. In other words, it ends with the reality that in spite of this idolatrous, iniquitous attitude, that God's people had. He still loves them. 
still desires them and wants them to be his people. Now, as we conclude this evening, I think it's only fair for us to say there's not a single individual with whom iniquity does not find its place in our hearts. Isn't it so? And there wouldn't have been anyone in Israel when God said, you know, to the elders, He said, I'm going to tell us to the elders, I'm going to tell us any man in Israel. There would not have been anyone in Israel to whom God would not have said, hey, stop worshiping idols or you'll have consequences. But ultimately what he's saying is, I want you to be my people. I want to be your God. And let's ponder that for a minute, shall we? God does not have some unsatiated desire or need to be acknowledged or worshipped. He isn't just seeking anyone that will love Him. He isn't unfulfilled if He cannot be worshipped. He loves people. He wants to bless them. And He wants a relationship with them. And people need God. I don't want to take anything. You can take anything and you get extreme with it and you can, you can go too far or you can go to the point of being wrong about it. But I will just say God doesn't need us. We need Him. And here are people who are pretending to need God but ultimately don't want anything to do with God. How ridiculous is that? I have seen individuals scorned for no reason. Junior high, for instance. You got the nice kid that's kind and gentle and wants to be a friend to people, cares about them. And he's nice to a kid and another kid is just mean to him. Picks on him. And then hangs around with people that don't even like him. You ever seen that? You ever seen the guy that goes to the friends that aren't even his friends? And he scorns the guy who really wants to be his friend, who really is a friend, really cares about him. I don't know how many times I've seen that in my life in relationships, not just in junior high, but a lot of times in a lot of places. And you think about it, the guy who's trying to be a friend doesn't need a friend. He's trying to be a friend. <clears throat> but the guy who he is trying to befriend acts as though there's something desirable about him. You know, as though, you need me and you're not getting me, buddy. I need you. He's, he's not a mess like you are. Not a train wreck like you are. I don't know how many times I've seen that happen in life. The most ridiculous area it happens is when the true living God wants to have a relationship with someone. And so instead, that individual chooses sin and idols. The devil's not your friend, and you ought to know it. Idols aren't real, and you ought to know it. Sin will destroy your life, and you ought to know it. And God just wants to deliver you. And that's what you really ought to know. And here I see an irony. I see the irony of a God who's too good for these people. Wanting them to be His people. And a people who aren't good enough for their God. Not wanting Him to be their God. And there's no difference in it when we regard iniquity in our hearts either. Father, I pray that you would just allow this truth to sink in for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.